G'day and welcome back. Today I haven't got a complete radio, but I do have the chassis. Uh, this belongs to a friend of mine, and he bought it as a whole radio. He's kept the case and he mailed this down to me to fix the uh, chassis up. This is the Tasma Model 1002. It's from 1947. Now it's not in fantastic condition. He took all the valves out to transport it down. Uh, the, the, there's a bit of rust on it and uh, yeah, it's not that bad, I guess. The tuning capacitor is very rusty. These are the wires going up to the electrodynamic speaker. Uh, there's no cap on the plug there. Uh, speaker's not so good. It's electrodynamic, but uh, I don't have a spare one of those, uh, so I'm going to have to try and repair that cone there. I'm missing the dial glass. The owner said he was taking it off to transport. Uh, what I didn't realise was he was going to keep it, uh, so it's going to make it a bit tricky to align this later on. Uh, but I can work around that. This is what the radio looks like with the case. This is my radio. I did this up some years ago. Uh, it was pretty beaten up. The speaker was missing, the valves were missing, and the case had a big crack in it. But uh, it repaired all right, and uh, it works very well. Very nice radio, actually. I'll flip it over. We'll have a look underneath. Here's the bottom view, and it's not in the best of shape. Someone's replaced a lot of the capacitors, um, I'd say in the 60s, looking at the capacitors, maybe late 50s. But the wire, all the uh, insulation is just hard, you can't, if I bend that, it'll just fall off. The wires are like this one, uh, all these, these are going off to the rectifier. Another one there, that's a ground wire, but uh, that's just indicative of what the wire is like. Now if you watch my channel before, you'll know that I like putting the power on before I do anything to the radio. I make sure it's safe, of course. Put it on through a dim bulb and just see what happens, how it performs, what it does. And that's for my benefit, so that I know what's going on, what goes wrong with these things. If there is a fault, how does it show itself, how does it manifest itself. And the other reason I do it is because nobody wants to sit there watching someone change parts, turn it on and it works fine. I want to see what it does when it's not working. But at this one, I am not totally keen. I've got to say though, any of the wires that are in a poor condition aren't touching anything. The insulation is still there, it's just that if you touch it, it's going to fall off. I've had a good look around. I can't see anything that's going to give me any grief. I will end up replacing all this wiring because it's no good. I can't possibly hand this back with wiring that just falls apart. But I really want to see if it works. Well, I've checked the power transformer. That buzzed out okay. It's not shorting to ground. Nothing shorting to ground. Um, I do want to check this output transformer. So there's a wire there, and it should be this red one here. And we should get, oh, I don't know, 500 ohms. Or so. There it is, 500 ohms. So close enough. All right, so that's okay. I have all the valves here. I will put them in, and we will try it out. Okay, I'm ready to go. I do have a Variac here. It's set to 240 volts. Yeah. If you haven't seen my videos before, this is a fully isolated power supply. There's a isolation transformer underneath the bench. The whole set is isolated from the mains, which means I've got no potential to earth. So I'm a little bit safer. That won't stop smoke coming out there. Now I've just changed the batteries in the smoke detector and I rang my insurance. It says we're fully covered. I'm on dim bulb. We'll put some power on. I expect that bulb to come on bright, dull off. I expect maybe 15 watts, 17 watts, something there. If that doesn't happen, I'll turn this off. Oh, it's doing some funny things. The bulb's flashing a little bit, so that's a bit unusual. And we've got 19, 20 watts there. 180 volts. It's dropping, so it's starting to conduct. Uh, I'll just turn it up. There's no noise at all. If I put my finger on there. Okay, that's feeding into the speaker. So from there on, it's got some sort of uh, circuit. So that would mean this area here is perhaps not working. Here's a closer view of that mixer valve and it's not working. There's no heat and there's the filament in there and there's no glow. So it's definitely not working. I'll go and get another valve. We'll try that. So I've got a brand new 6SA7 GT. So I'll put that in and see if that works. Let's put the power on again. That's got a little light in it now. 
Now that voltage has dropped off to 188, uh, probably due to that valve working. I'll change the load, we'll get a bit more power out of it. So that's a higher wattage load, we'll see what happens. Well, we've got a, we've got a station now, um, it's, it's not very loud there. So. Putting my finger on the grids, getting a fair buzz through it. Because there's caps off, I can get to the plate voltage, so should be 200 odd. There we go, 204. So, 215. I have a little voltage chart for the radio here, so I can check all the uh, plate and uh, screen voltages. And I'll just mark the numbers, which happen to be all the same. So, let's have a go at doing that, and see if we can find what's wrong. Right, here's the mixer. Uh, pin number three is the plate. We should have, oh, 215. Close enough. And number four should be 100. That's exactly right. Here's the IF and the reflex valve. It should be 123 again. I'm supposed to have 155. I've got 144. Number four should be 100. That's exactly what it is. See, they're pretty good. Uh, here's the output valve, one, two, three. We already measured this because I measured it up the top on that plug here, 200. Uh, this is the screen here, I think. That should be a bit higher, 213. So the voltages are spot on. Um, so the voltages are okay. It could be a valve, of course. Uh, I'm seeing smoke. I'm seeing smoke. There's whiffs of smoke coming up here. Now, if you have a look at this capacitor here, it's ready to blow. It's starting to bulge and it's bubbling up. So I'll turn the power off and I'll change that cap and see what happens. Okay, I've tacked a new one in there. Uh, it's 8 microfarad. I don't think that's going to be uh, the problem, but uh, good to get it out of there. No. Yeah, I didn't think that would do anything. I've flipped the radio over and I've got power on at the moment. I've changed these two valves here and it's made no difference. It might be a little bit louder, but it's, it's, it's not fixed it. So just to recap, we know it's working from here. I've checked all the voltages, all the valves are getting the correct voltage. We know all the valves work. I've replaced that valve as well, so we know the issue isn't that valve. The fault therefore is between here and the aerial wire. Now if I put my finger on the grid of this one, we should be able to eliminate from here to there. Here's the bottom of the mixer valve, pin 8 is the grid. If I scrape it like that, yeah, see it's working there. I put my finger on it. Right, that's brought everything in. I'll just show you where that is on the circuit. This is the mixer valve I was just looking at. There's pin 8, when I put my finger on there, it buzzed through the radio and increased the signal strength. So therefore, it's in here. The fault is in here. Alright, let's, let's have a look at this. The antenna coil is mounted on top of the chassis on this radio. Uh, here's the uh, core adjustment. There's the two mounting nuts. There's a terminal there, there, there and over here. The orange wire is the antenna coming in. The, and this wire here is going off to the grid of the mixer. I've put my oscilloscope on, so I'll just have a look. This is the antenna in, so this should have everything on it. So that's every bit of static and radio station coming in. Here's where it should come out. I'll see where it's got there. And we've got nothing. Well, we certainly haven't got a station. No, look at that. There's nothing there. Uh, so I should be able to tune... No, that's just feedback. All right, that would indicate the problem is probably in that antenna coil. So maybe I'll just flip it over. We'll just see if I can see anything wrong. I had a look around the coil, and I think that's a break there. Yeah. I think that that's a wire coming off that post, and it's not connected. So looks like I have to take that coil out. I'll desolder these wires here and release the two nuts and we'll have a closer look at that coil. Here's the coil and there's the broken wire. It's supposed to wrap around this post here. 
That wire will now be too short. What I'll do is wrap a bit of thicker wire around this post here and take it out to the broken bit of wire. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is get all this dust off here. If, uh, if I melt the wax, I don't want dust in it, so I'll get rid of all that first. Otherwise, we're going to have a dirty looking coil. All right, I've cleaned that up. It's much cleaner now. There's the little wire. Now the trick is to get it back here. It's got a big lump of uh, wax on the top of it. Let's see if I can melt it off. Now I just went off to get a flamethrower to burn that insulation off here. And when I looked again, there's another bit of wire there which I've pulled out. And it's going to the same place. The wire here goes to the inside of the coil and the outside of the coil then runs down here and goes over to another post here which is earth. So what is this second wire? I'll burn the insulation off and, and check them with the meter and see what they're doing. I'll check these two with the meter and see if I can get any continuity. No. Um, now this is the ground point on the coil, so one of these wires should go through to that. Not that one. This is the wire that was broken off. Nothing. Hmm. So that means there's another break in this coil. I don't know what's going on here. It's come out. It must have just been a bit of offcut sitting in the wax. I've dug a little hole in where this wire is going under the wax here. So I'll clip onto that. All right, so we've got continuity between here and that wire. So the issue isn't there. What I'm going to do is fix this wire here and stabilize it so it doesn't get broken off. So I'll wrap a bit of thin wire around here, carry it over there and solder that onto that wire. So I've wrapped a bit of wire around this uh, post here, I'll solder that on. Just try and wrap this wire around at least once if I can. I've got it wrapped around once so that, that'll have to do. There we go. So I'll cut that excess off. I can bend that in a bit and that'll just give a bit of uh, flex in that wire there. I'm going to check for continuity between this post here and where I bed the wire going into the coil. Somewhere there it is. Okay. So we've got continuity into the coil. I'm not sure how far into. I've flipped the uh, coil over. This is where it comes out. And I'll just try and bear a bit of that wire, see if it's got continuity to there. If it had continuity, it hasn't now. I think I just broke it off. <laughs> Alright, I'll put my probe on here then. There's continuity there, so from there to there is okay. <laughs> I'll have to try and dig this wire out. I've pulled the wire out there, I'll just hit it with a flamethrower and see if I can clear the, the enamel of it. Okay, so now we've got continuity between the repair and where it's coming out of the coil. So the coil's okay. I pulled both those little wires out of there and I mid-air soldered them. I just want to see if it's got continuity. I will do a proper repair, of course. And we have. So that coil is now connected. Is it possible that was broken just exactly where I was going to try and check it? I don't know. It didn't have continuity before I broke that wire. This wire goes down here and connects to this post. I will run another bit of wire across there and pick up that wire and that'll be solid. Well there's the second repair there and I've picked up the wire so that's quite stable. I will drop a bit of hot glue on there or something just to make sure it doesn't move. 
before I put this back I'll check continuity again and they're the two I repaired and we know they're okay now these two should also have continuity yep. and there should be no continuity between any of the others All right. I've put it back in and I've just blob soldered it uh, they've all got to come out so it's probably more glued on with solder than soldered really I'll flip it over we'll see if it works I think I'm ready to go I'll put some power on now, I'm pretty sure this will work well that's flat out again it hasn't fixed it I can't believe that uh, okay it's got to fix it yeah, it's got some loose stuff there Oh, yeah. I just touched the antenna coil. Yeah, there we go. That mostly we have here. But what makes us cooperate with each other? And right, so my blob soldering job's not working, I don't think. Yeah, I've just got a bad solder where I just threw the solder at it. I resoldered that point there. That's the wire that goes off to the grid in the mixer valve. Right, let's try it again. Take two. No, yeah, that didn't fix it either. Yeah. Must be that join down there. Hang on. I've resoldered that one. It looked all right, but uh, I've done it again. We'll see if that fixes it. All right, third time's the charm. I'll try again. Right, but I mean, interesting that there is an ongoing debate in behavioral sciences whether intuitions are helpful or whether it's um, you know, deliberation that we should be relying on in our decision. Much. I didn't think it would get to number one. We've scheduled moving house on that. Was it last weekend? Problems called Tilde Lad. So race, right, race one for Ironclad, race two. That's working very nice. That's what I was saying earlier. If you just pull it apart and change all the parts and it didn't work, where do you start looking? Or you're just going to check all your work, trying to find something like that, pretty difficult. I probably would have seen it during the strip down process, but it could have been a problem somewhere else. Anyway, it did a bit of troubleshooting too, so that's good. I always learn from troubleshooting. All right, the next step is to start dismantling this whole chassis. I've got to get all the wiring changed. I'll contact the owner and see if he wants it repainted while I've got it apart. And hopefully it'll come back as a nice, reliable, uh, good quality radio. I've been in contact with the owner. He said, give it the full works. So I'm going to strip all this off and I will repaint the chassis, repair the transformer, fix that speaker, of course. I'll paint the whole thing. I'll clean the rust off the capacitor here and replace all the faulty wiring. Um, I've got a new plug to put in here. So I'll change that, change all that wiring as well. So I'll get started. That didn't take long and that's as far as I need to go. I'm going to leave the IF transformers here. I'll put something around to protect them. 
Now the trick of course is uh, trying to get it back together. So I'm going to adjourn to my workshop and uh, get, prepare this for painting. I'm out in the workshop, I've just cleaned this off with a brush and some compressed air and it's come up pretty well. It has got some rust areas that I need to treat uh, but overall it's, it's not as bad as I initially thought but I think I'll still paint it and the main reason is that the uh, top of the transformer is so rusty that that needs to be done, I can't get around that, you can't leave it like that. So if I do that and leave the rest of the chassis it's going to look silly. I think what I'll do is, is sand it back and prep it up for painting. Now we will lose the sticker on the back here, I've made a replica sticker of this with the same number so I'll put that back on, I think it'll look alright. Alright I've cleaned all that off now and it's come up really good uh, where the rust areas were around here I've sanded them off, I will put some rust treatment on it. I sandblasted the lid of the transformer and it's just soaking in some phosphoric acid and that's looking really good now. Uh, it was really rusty under the paint but uh, I'll just let it soak for a bit longer and uh, that should clean up nicely. I've got a late start today so I've run out of time. Uh, tomorrow morning I'll come out and mask all this up and give it a coat of paint. So I'll see you in the morning. Good morning, I'm back again. I left this uh, transformer cover in the phosphoric acid for a couple of hours last night and it comes out with this black coating on it which protects it from further corrosion. I've run over this with some steel wool just to clean off the black stuff ready to paint. Uh, it's left some damage from the uh, corrosion but I think the paint will just about fill that. Now the next step is to mask this off and then paint it. So I've done this a number of times on different videos. If you're new to the channel I'll just show you basically what I do to mask it off. Uh, these are fridge magnets sent around by real estate agents. Stick them on your fridge. Uh, but they're very handy to stick to metal on the chassis. So I reuse them. I've used this one a number of times. And it's simply a matter of just sliding them in and sticking them to the chassis and that's it. That's all you've done. You've masked that off completely in seconds. For the valve sockets all I do is put a bit of masking tape over them and push it around with my finger and then simply cut it around there with the, with a sharp knife and that should come off there we go so that takes seconds to do that another thing I do is cover these rivets so they don't get paint on them I've got a piece of masking tape I've used a hollow punch to just punch out little discs and I just place them over the top and they're covered so I'll do that to all these rivets here and when the paint job's finished uh, I'll put some clear lacquer over these rivets to stop them corroding again. So leave it with me, I'll mask all this off and come back and we'll paint it. I've finished masking it up, it's ready to paint. Uh, I've also got the transformer top here and there's a bracket there that's on the speaker so I'm going to repaint that, I didn't strip that off the paint. It's pretty good but I'll just make it the same colour at least. I've written on the top of the paint, it's a Tasma Green, I had it mixed specially for Tasma radios. Uh, and it's a water-based paint but it's a uh, rust inhibiting paint so uh, it's good it goes on very easily uh, these have all come up very nice I've got to wait two hours and then give it another coat I'll assess it then if I think it needs another coat I'll do it, if I don't think it needs it I'll leave it. In any case I'll leave it for the rest of the day to dry and tomorrow I'll take all the tape off and I can start reassembling it. I've made the lawns and I still need to wait for the paint to dry so in the meantime I thought I might dunk this in some wax and just try and re-wax the areas that I worked on. Now of course this wax is red. I've got some wax here and I've added a bit of my granddaughter's red crayon to it to make it red. It's very bright red, I'm not sure how it's going to go. I'll just stir it up a bit. So I guess that's the colour it's going to come out. It's going to be a pink colour, isn't it? I'm not sure about that. I might add a bit more red to it, I think. I've added a fair bit more crayon, so I'll try that. Still looks pretty pink. <laughs> that colour's no good. I'll go and add some more red to this. It's um, wow, it's really come out pink, hasn't it? 
Uh, now I've gone and added some more crayon. In fact, I've used the whole crayon. Uh, this has dried about the right colour, so uh, it's still a little pinkish. I'll see how we go. Why not? Hmm, where's my red crown? Uh, that looks much better. I'll let it cool off. We'll see what it looks like. That's come up really nice. Uh, there's the repair that I did, and there's the other one. And uh, yeah, they look like they've been there for years. Uh, have so you I'll... seen my red crown? Another thing I need to look at is the speaker. The holes in it are one thing, but the whole diaphragm's kind of weak, the material's weak, it's starting to crack around the ridge there. I've got replacement surrounds that I could fit, but they are bulbs, so they would hit the case when this is mounted. So I can't use those. I tried to get new cones, uh, but they've all got bulbs on them. I did find some in America, um, but they're going to take a month or two to get here, and the cost is worth more than the radio. So. Uh, I'm a bit stuck. What I have done in the past is paint the entire surround here with contact adhesive and that's a rubber adhesive that never really dries. It's still flexible but it'll take all the strain off that material that's in there. Um, it's got so many little holes in it I'm almost thinking of putting um, some tea bag material in there and just painting the whole thing on. So I think that's what I'll do now. I'll put some tea bag on here, paint it all in with the uh, adhesive and see how it comes up if it can still work properly. If that all fails I'll have to go and source some cones even if it means getting them from America. Now I'm just going to break in here because this was a complete failure. I painted all around with a contact adhesive and put tea bags on and it was all right initially but the next day it was very very stiff. It was going to inhibit the um, movement of the speaker too much. So rather than watch a failure I might as well just skip it I'll go on to what I did in the end to repair the speaker. I've made a further efforts to get a new cone and I just can't do it. I just cannot find any with a ribbed surround on it. I have these foam surrounds and these have the dome on it which I was referring to yesterday. And of course when you mount it in there it sticks up higher than the original speaker so it's always a problem. As I said this sits up against the front of the case so what I'm going to do is remove this uh, spacer here and I'll print a new one, a new longer one, so that it uh, makes sure that it doesn't hit the case and I'll mount the speaker back uh, enough to uh, give it the clearance. I've fitted these a number of times on different videos so I'm not going to go into great detail here. Uh, basically it involves removing the gasket here, cutting away the old speaker, cut away around here and just leave that center piece. Then you glue this on here and then glue it to whatever part of the cone's remaining. The well, first thing I'm going to do is just cut this gasket off with a knife. And then I'll come back and I'll show you the next step. I've taken the gasket off but I've still left the cone attached to the basket here. I just want it to stay there. But this will let the foam surround sit down properly. I'll put a bit of tape there to hold the corners of the, the surround on. I've got this on a carousel. I'm just going to try and mark where I need to cut, or I don't need to cut here, but oops. That's basically it, it's not easy to do. Now I need to cut up here somewhere, it's about the width of that flange there, do not have any hanging over inside here, if it's not glued down it, it's uh, likely to flutter. By good fortune I've got a roll of masking tape here that's about the right diameter, so I'll try and mark it. That's come out okay, I can use that. Alright, that's come out pretty good. I've removed the rest of the gasket from the edge there. You may be able to see there's a gap between the cone and the new surround. I've got some little strips of plastic here. If I lift the cone up, I can insert it between the cone and the voice coil, or the magnet and the voice coil. All right, those bits of plastic are holding the cone up a bit higher. 
Now all I have to do is paint it with some adhesive. All right, now just pop this on. So I'll just put this bit of masking tape on to hold it while it's set, just to make sure it's got an even pressure on it. Now I'll leave that to dry. In the meantime, I'll print out a collar to go around the edges there. All right, this should have dried by now. We'll have a look. That looks good. That looks really good. That's stuck perfectly there. Great. Now while I was waiting for it to dry, I printed out a little gasket here, or a spacer I guess it is now. Yeah, that's nice too. Good. I've taken the two plastic spacers out of there. I've put three pieces of paper in there. That's all I could get in. It's very tight. But that'll keep it centered while I glue this together, just so that this doesn't pull it off to one side. So the next step is to lift this up, put a bit of adhesive around the rim here, and glue that down, and that'll be it. All right, once again, I'll just let that dry for a couple of hours and uh, we'll come back and see what it looks like. Uh, the glue's dried, so I'll just pull these little spaces out. Let's make sure the voice coil's not hitting the center pole. Yep, that sounds great. All right. As I said, I printed a spacer out and that'll fit in there. I'll just glue that in. And there's a little filter to put in there. So I'll glue all that together and that's done. We'll move on to the next bit. Here's the back side of the speaker. I've repainted the output transformer that was very rusty on the top there. So I had to get rid of all the rust and respray it. I've replaced the sheathing on this wire here with some heat shrink. Uh, the voice coil wires are the original plastic wire. I've fitted some braided sleeving to the wires and here's the old plug. I've got a new one which I'm going to wire these into. I've tinned the end of the wire. I'm ready to put the wires in. Here's the old plug and I've marked on uh, the side here the various color wires uh, so I can just copy those onto there. I know that one's yellow because it's still got a bit of yellow there. I just tried to put this in and then heat it. I think I'll do it the other way around. I'll heat it then stick the wire in. That looks better. This last one I preheated the pin just to Make sure it was hot enough if I have two wires going in there. Oh, that's come out pretty good. I'll pull this braiding down. I've put a bit of heat shrink on the end of the braiding to hold it together. I know you can tuck it in and glue it and melt it. I know all those things, but uh, this works better for me on this one. I'll just check the wires, make sure they are correct. And that's yellow and that's red, so yep, we're good. Let's put his lid on. All, right. All done. Good. It's the next day. Uh, this is quite dry now. I've also cleaned up a lot of the other stuff and given them a coat of paint or polish. Uh, here's the dial surround, so I've painted that on both sides. I'll start uh, pulling all the masking off now and uh, I'll come back when it's all cleaned up. I've removed all the masking and uh, yeah, it's come up pretty good. I've got a bit of ink relac here and a paintbrush. I'm just going to paint the top of these uh, rivets that I uh, covered up with the tape. And that'll just stop them corroding too fast. They'll probably corrode eventually, but this will slow it down at least. So I'll do all those. I'll do the little brass rivets in here as well. When I finish this, I'll take it inside and we'll start putting it back together. I'm sorry to break this video into two, but it's just running too long. I hope you enjoyed part one. In part two, I've got to replace all the wiring. I reassemble it and put some power on, and the result is interesting, and it's a bit more troubleshooting to do. So I hope you can join me next week for my Tasma 1002 radio adventure.